I'm so touched by what so many of you have said about this uh, effort to convey to you ideas that are being developed in this book. Now, I don't know what we're going to call that book yet. I've only had one suggestion on paper, and that was the topsy-turvy teachings of Jesus. <laughs> well, we must have a, if you have a suggestion about a title, that's something else you can drop on this table here. And uh, it will certainly be considered very carefully. In fact, I always have been sending the publishers about a hundred titles. And then they call together all their salesmen and they say, which of these titles will sell the best? So we want a hundred titles. You can have 300 if you want it. That many of you here. I think by this time that you have seen that the commandment which Jesus emphasized the most was not one of the ten, it was the eleventh one. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Now, tonight, in the time I have, I want to talk to you a little bit further uh, about the Jesus as the divine Son of God. One of the ministers said to me, although you talked about the Virgin Mary, what you really are talking about is that Jesus Christ was the divine Son of God and is yet. Now, the story that I shall start with tonight, very briefly, is known to you all. It's the story of the prodigal son. This uh, young boy with a lot of life and a little bit wild asked his father to give him everything he had that, that belonged to him, to divide it between him and his older brother. And he went off and fell in bad company and finally lost it all and was trying to eat what the pigs ate. And then he said, I'll go home back to my father and I'll tell him I've sinned against you and against heaven. Make me a servant this time. His father, you remember, said, bring the rings and put them on his fingers and kill a fatted calf and let's have a great fiesta. For my son was lost, but he's found. But the elder brother was jealous. He wouldn't go in. He said, you never treated me like this. And then you know what his father said to him. Well, this story tells us what the difference between the attitude of Jesus toward undeserving sinners like that boy and our customary attitude is we punish him, go to the court, send them to jail, perhaps execute them. And we don't know how yet to love our wavered brothers as we love ourselves. Now, Jesus told another parable that the preachers don't like to touch very much. I never heard one of them preach about it. And their congregations don't like to hear it, but it's terribly unforgettable. And yet it's perfectly in harmony with everything Jesus taught. A rich man feasted sumptuously, ate too much, and overate, killed himself, and went to hell. Outside of his gate, there was a starving man, covered with sores. He tried to get enough of the food they ate throughout the dogs, but he didn't get enough. He starved to death and went to heaven. And uh, there was only one reason why that rich man went to hell, and that was he ignored the hunger of that beggar Lazarus. 
all who neglect Lazarus are consigned to hell with Dives by this story. <sighs> Inasmuch as you do it to the least of these hungry, naked, sick, imprisoned strangers, you do it to me in that wonderful story. And if you don't do it, depart from me, you accursed, into the everlasting fire prepared by the devil and his angels. I'm just quoting Jesus. Today, half the world is hungry. Half the world is Lazarus. The greatest famine in the history of mankind is on the way in. Within five years, it will be here, greater than we've ever had before. Not in America, not in the West, not in Canada. It'll be among those illiterate half of the world in Asia and Africa and Latin America where the population is growing faster than they can feed them. All the educated people say this now, all the students, and we in America are divies. We're richer than any country ever was. We're by no means all alike. There are a great many who pity the hungry half of the world. Some of you have proven that to me. Not only by your words, but by your gifts this week. That we're trying, many of us, to meet that need. There are Americans who collaborate with the people who are exploiting those people and help to exploit them. Alas, our government in its international relations has nearly always been supporting those exploiters against Lazarus. Our armies protect the property rights of the men who exploit Lazarus and in doing so, find themselves on the side of Dives nine times out of ten. Now, I don't suppose I'm telling you anything new, you knew it, before I told you that. It's human nature. Who can blame us? Business is business. Well, Jesus blames us. The judgment day blames us. It's an agonizing predicament for us who want to help Lazarus, but are compelled to invest half of our federal taxes to support a mighty force that too often suppresses the revolt of Lazarus. And uh, Fortune magazine last year published an article in which it said that we have plenty of money, plenty of know-how to feed all the hungry people in the world. We know just what to do, but we don't have the will to do it, said not the Bible, Fortune magazine. So we Christians have to lead the way out to reach those, reach Lazarus. I'll perhaps say more about that before we're finished here. Now, Jesus warned us against imagining that we're better than other people. He told the story about the Pharisee who stood up in the temple and said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, greedy, dishonest, adulterous, like that tax collector over there. I fast two days a week. I don't know what he did with the food if he fasted. I pay tithes on 10% of everything I get. But that tax collector feeling a real sense of guilt, would not raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, said Jesus, the tax collector went home justified rather than the other man who exalted him. He exalts himself and be humbled. Now, I want to take you to another Thing that how impossible almost it is for a man like Dives, a rich man, to get to heaven unless his heart's touched. He's shown by a rich young ruler who knelt at the feet of Jesus and said to him, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? God gave a strange reply. He said, why do you call me God? Good. There's only one good. 
Now that's often been quoted to indicate that Jesus didn't regard himself as sinless. No, it could just as properly have been interpreted to mean, you mean to say that you know I am the Christ? Only the Christ is good. Is that what you mean? But one can imagine Jesus raising his eyebrows and smiling as he made his reply. Probably the rich young man smiled too. It meant nothing excepting, oh, of course, if you mean that. Jesus didn't wait for a reply. This is what he said. All right, you want eternal life? Keep the commandments. The young man said, which ones? Jesus said, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And he added the next great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, and that was the hardest of them all. And, uh, but the young man uh, said, this is the only commandment which that rich young man had not kept. It was easier for camels to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich young man like he is to keep that commandment and be as solicitous about the welfare of everybody as is about himself. And so Jesus brought out swiftly what followed. The young man, a truly beautiful character, said, I have obeyed these commandments. What else shall I do? And Jesus looked at him and loved him. So do we all love him? This very question, what shall I, do I still lack, showed a lovely humility. And Jesus said to this young man, there's one thing you lack, if you want to be perfect. Go and use your property to help the poor, and you will have riches in heaven. And then come and follow me. Jesus had asked him to do exactly what St. Francis of Assisi did many centuries later. If this young man had done what Jesus asked, he would have proved that he loved his neighbor as himself, that he included every beggar and every starving child as his neighbor. But that was just too much. He dropped his head poor boy, turned and went away without an answer. He knew Jesus was right, but this was just too much. He loved his riches, his comforts, and his family too much he couldn't let loose. Jesus watched him go. And then he turned to his disciples and said, I tell you, it is hard for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. These topsy-turvy ethics staggered his disciples. They were utterly amazed, the Bible says. And they said, my goodness, who then can be saved if a model young man like that can't get in? Jesus said, my children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. And they asked him again, who then can be saved? And Jesus gave this reply, for man it looks impossible, but not for God. With God, all things are possible. Now, the reason the disciples were perfectly astounded was because the Jews often thought that wealth was a sign that God approved people. He gave them riches when he approved. And now Jesus tells them that wealth can keep you out of heaven. Somersault ethics. There is one statement of Jesus in that conversation which shows how a wealthy man can get into the kingdom of heaven and find riches waiting for him there, a bank account when he gets there. Use your money to help need, and you will have a bank account in heaven. It's never too late for a rich man to do that, transfer his bank account to heaven. Now Jesus soon had another, much happier experience with another rich man who did transfer his bank account to heaven. His name was Zacchaeus. He was a wealthy tax collector in Jericho, very wealthy. 
Jesus is passing through Jericho on the way to Jerusalem. There was such a large crowd watching him go by that Zacchaeus, a little fellow, climbed a sycamore tree so that he could see him go by. And Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down quickly. I want to stay in your house today. So Zacchaeus hurried down and gave Jesus a warm welcome. But as they started toward his home, everybody was complaining so Zacchaeus could hear it. He's going to stay with that bad man. Zacchaeus couldn't stand it. He stopped in the middle of the street and he said, Here, Master, I'm going to give half of my property to the poor. And if I've ever defrauded anybody, I'm going to give him four times as much. And Jesus joyfully exclaimed, Today salvation has come to this house. And then for the sake of those grumbling people, he added, The Son of Man has come to seek and save lost men. Now you see, Zacchaeus had repented with more than words, and even enough, with deeds. That's how a rich man could get to heaven. And it's true of us all. All of us compared to the hungry people of the world are rich. Now, Jesus started up the Jericho road to Jerusalem. Luke says the disciples were expecting the kingdom of God would appear just as soon as he got to the city. Zebedee's wife and the mother of James and John, two of the disciples, came and bowed low before Jesus and asked a favor of him. And Jesus said, what favor do you want? And at that moment, James and John stepped forward themselves. They said, we would like to sit at your right hand and your left hand in the glory of your kingdom. They thought they ought to get in a good word first. They thought the kingdom was coming the following week. Jesus said, you do not know what you're asking for, boys. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Can you be baptized the way I'll be? They said, yes, we can. And Jesus said, then you will drink that cup that I'm going to drink. They were crucified. And you will be baptized the way I'll be baptized, but I do not have the choice of who will sit at my right hand and my left. My Father has that choice. He's given it to those for whom he has prepared it. Here, as always, it was his Father who made the decisions. What must Jesus have thought? These two men, who had been with him for months and months, breaking the great commandment, love your neighbors yourself, the other ten, were to be left out. Now the other disciples were naturally very angry and they gave Jesus a chance to astonish them again by what he said. It was some more somersault ethics. Those who are supposed to rule the heathen lorded over them and their great men tyrannize over them but it is not to be so among you but whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be, hold the first place must be the willing slave of all. The Son of Man himself has come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for others. Now the impending crisis was in the air. As they trudged up the road toward Jerusalem, the disciples were afraid more than they'd ever been before in all their lives. They knew too well that the council in Jerusalem had met and agreed to kill Jesus as soon as they could get hold of him, and that he was going up to the city to let them kill him. He didn't dispel their fear. He gathered the disciples around him and he said, We are going up to Jerusalem, and there the Son of Man will be handed over by, to the high priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, hand him over to the Roman soldiers. They'll ridicule him and spit him and flog on him and kill him. Three days after, he will be raised from the dead. 
the disciples had heard him say this several times before, but it was so utterly fantastic. They couldn't imagine it. But in his mind, his course was clear. He was going up to Jerusalem to let them kill him. He would say and do things which would drive the rulers to greater fury. He knew it would. They would kill him just when and how his father chose. His enemies didn't choose the time nor the place. His father did. He who had listened to the father from his childhood, from the time he was three years old, was following him step by step now to his death. He told his disciples about it in advance, so that after his resurrection, their faith would be strengthened. Jesus and his party reached Bethany six days before that festival, before he was to be crucified. Simon, whom he had cured of leprosy, gave a dinner for him in his home. Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, I didn't tell you that story for lack of time, he sat beside Jesus. Martha was waiting at the table. Mary came in, and she poured a flask of expensive perfume on Jesus' head. Then she poured some of it on his feet, and she wiped his feet with her hair. The whole house was filled with the fragments of the perfume. Judas is carried, and some more of the disciples too grumbled. What was the use of wasting perfume like that? It might have been sold for sixty dollars, and then the money could have been given to the poor. Only it wouldn't have been. Judas was a thief. He was the treasurer, and he used to steal out of the treasury. Well, Jesus knew this, and I suppose he felt like saying something to Judas, but he didn't. All he said was, leave her alone. Why do you bother her? She's done a fine thing for me. She's perfumed my body in preparation for my burial. And then he looked at Mary and he said, wherever the good news is preached all over the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her all over the world. Jesus foresaw. In fact, his father told him that his death would become the central fact in history, the central fact in all the world. Mary had done infinitely more than she dreamed when she followed her heart. We often do infinitely more than we dream when we follow the call of love for Jesus. Many of the pilgrims who had heard about the raising of Lazarus came there to Bethany to see him and Jesus. Jesus' his disciples and many of these pilgrims stayed there in Bethany over the Jewish Sabbath. And then this crowd followed Jesus on Sunday morning. Those who had seen Lazarus raised from the dead were telling hundreds of thousands of other people of the incredible miracle of his raising from the dead. Dead. And that, John says, is the reason the crowds followed him as he went into Jerusalem. The Messiah was here, the all-powerful leader. He was going to her room out of Jerusalem and set Israel free. Now, Jesus had arranged to ride a donkey into Jerusalem. The crowd went wild. Many of them spread their coats in the road before him, and many others scattered straw from the fields along the road. The entire throng began to praise God. God bless the son of David. God bless the king who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the kingdom of our father David that is just now coming. Their excitement was terrific. Josephus says that about 2,700,000 Jews would come back to the Passover feast. Thousands upon thousands of them followed Jesus in what they hoped would be the liberation of Israel from Rome. Anybody who could raise the dead could make them immune to death and could exterminate the Romans at the command of his voice. But suddenly, in the midst of the shouting, Jesus burst out weeping. 
His disciples heard what he said above the tumult. He had just come in view of Jerusalem, and he said, Oh, weeping about the city, if only you knew today the conditions of peace. They're hidden from your eyes. Therefore, the time is coming when your enemies will throw earthworks about you and surround you and shut you in on every side. They will throw you and your children to the ground. They will not leave a stone upon another within you because you did not know when God was visiting you. They didn't know that this was the Father of Jesus who was visiting them in his Son. They wanted David to return with his swords, not God with love and forgiveness. They wanted war and victory. Forty years later they had it. Jerusalem revolted. The Romans destroyed the entire city so completely that not one stone remained upon another. In fact, the prophecy of Jesus came true so amazingly that higher critics conjecture that the story must have been made up by the writers of the gospel. Well, there was a little left. The story of the destruction of Jerusalem is that Titus left a part of the wall and three towers and nothing else. Now, the night of the triumphant entry, as it's called by us, Jesus walked back to Bethany where Mary and Martha lived and Lazarus and spent the night there. And the next morning, Monday, he started to turn the world upside down again. He went back to Jerusalem into the temple, made a whip of cords and began to drive all the sheep and oxen out of the temple. He overturned the seats of those who sold doves and the tables of the money changers. He told these, those who sold pigeons to these pilgrims, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a marketplace. The scripture says my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Here there were two million people there from all over the world but you've made it a den of robbers. Now Jesus was certainly turning the world upside down, began it that day. Not only the tables and the money changers, but also the world. He was daring to attack greed wherever it was most powerful. And in doing that, he was signing his own death sentence for, I can't see very well, wait a minute. For here was the center of national power as well as tremendous profiteering. The tables of those money changers were used by the pilgrims to pay the temple tax. Only the Jewish money could be accepted. And those money changers made a profit on every coin changed for from foreign to Jewish money. Half a day's wages. There was profiteering on all the animals that were bought by the pilgrims. For example, the pigeons and the doves. They cost five or ten times as much in the temple, after they were blessed, as they cost at the market outside. But the temple inspectors would not accept those from outside. They always found a flaw in the birds. And so the temple profiteers had a monopoly on the business. It was the private business of the family of Annas, the, who had been the high priest. That was his profiteering. The, he was the father of the high priest when Jesus cleansed the temple. It was no accident that when Jesus was arrested the following Thursday night, he was taken first to the house of Annas, who was making that money, and then to the house of his son-in-law, Caiaphas, the high priest. He had dared to challenge their enormous prophet on these devout worshipers. Until this happened, the family of the high priest had been a little worried by what they heard about Jesus, and they supposed that someday they'd have to take a, something, do something about it. 
But after he threatened their prophets that day, they were after his blood. He would be dead four days later, and he chose the exact time. No man takes my life from me, he said. I give it of my own free will. It's what my father told me to do. He knew exactly what would happen when he attacked the prophets of Amos. Now I want you to return to the temple with me a little. You shall not make my father's house a marketplace. He didn't say your father. He didn't say our father, my father. The authorities asked him, what right have you to act this way? He didn't tell them, but he knew that house belonged to him, to his father. He was the only begotten son of God. It was his house. It belonged to him and his father. Now, we've already felt shock after shock. At least the people who listened to Jesus felt those shocks. As they heard original deep insights into God and the future lives that they never heard from anybody before. I think one reason he came was because God wanted to tell us these things. Now we come to another of those brilliant insights that made the hearers gasp with astonishment. It happened this way. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection, no heaven. We die all over like dogs. They tried to catch Jesus with this problem. They said, Moses says, if a man dies without children, his brother is to marry his widow and raise up children for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first died without any children and left his widow to his brother, and so did the second and the third and the rest of the seven. And last of all, the woman died at the, now at the resurrection. Whose wife will she be? They didn't believe there was one, for they all had her. Jesus then gave them this astonishing and novel reply. Those who are found worthy to attain the resurrection from the dead do not marry. They're not married. They cannot die. They're like the angels. After the resurrection, they are sons of God. The dead are raised to life. Moses made that clear in the passage about the bush when he called the Lord the Lord of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's not the God of dead men, but of living. One of the scribes answered, Master, that was a fine answer you gave. And it certainly was. There will be no sex in heaven. I hope that doesn't disappoint anybody. <laughs> Meanwhile, some Greek proselytes who were in Jerusalem for the Passover were talking to Philip. They asked him to help them see Jesus. Philip went and told Jesus, and his reply contained another of those surprises which meet us on every page when we hear him talk. These Greek proselytes seemed to be the signal. A proselyte means that they were not Jews originally, but they'd been converted to Judaism. Out of his mouth flowed one of the most beautiful and difficult paragraphs in the world. Time has come for the Son of Man to be, he didn't say crucified, glorified. What was the connection? Now those Greek visitors symbolized two million pilgrims who had come to the Passover. That was when the Son of Man was going to be glorified on a cross. That was how Jesus was letting his light shine on a hill, hanging on a cross, so that the world he had come to save might see him and glorify his Father in heaven. He said glorified, he meant crucified. Jesus continued, Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just one grain. But if it dies, it yields a great harvest. His body would die on the cross four days later, but the Christ would then enter and inhabit multitudes of bodies, a great harvest. And you who are here tonight are 
members of that great harvest. All over the world of those who would say, Christ lives in me. And then he continued, whoever loves his life is going to lose it. That is eternal life. Whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Wherever I am, my servant will be also. Jesus could see the great army of martyrs who would follow him to the cross. He continued, if anyone serves me, my father will show him honor. But he was suffering himself. He said to his disciples, my heart is almost breaking. What am I to say? Shall I say, Father, save me from this? No. It was for this purpose that I came. Father, go ahead, honor your name. Out of heaven came a voice, just as it did when he was baptized. It came to help Jesus to face the trial, and it came to help the disciples to face that ordeal. It said, I have honored it, and I will honor it again. Now, some people thought it thundered. Others thought an angel spoke to Jesus. And then he said to them, It was not for my sake that voice came, but for yours. And then he changed the subject abruptly. He was beginning to see visions. This is some, something he said. The judgment of the world is right now going on. The evil spirit of this world is right now being driven out. When I am lifted from the ground, I will draw all men to myself. He meant, when these multitudes, two million people, see me hanging crucified, compassion will draw them to me. That was the faith of Jesus, that love enough to die for men would woo the hearts of men to him. Now the question of the ages is whether that much pure love is strong enough to drive out the spirit of hate and greed in the world. You can't prove it, but as Senator Kennedy put it in his marvelous poem, I can bet my life on it, and I do. Jesus had bet his life on it. I hasten on. He saw all the tribulations which the world was going to over that was going to overtake his followers. And he said to them, Take care that nobody misleads you. False Christs, false prophets will show signs and wonders and mislead the chosen people if they can. Many will come under my name and say I am Christ and will mislead many. Because of the increase of wickedness, most men's love will grow cold. Many will fall away. They will betray one another, hate one another. You too will be hated because you bear my name. They will hand you over to the courts. You will be taken to synagogues and beaten. You'll be brought before governors and kings on my account to testify. And when they are taking you off, do not worry beforehand what you ought to say, but say whatever I give you at that time. It is not you who will speak, but the Holy Spirit. I'll help you out of such wisdom as none of your opponents will be able to resist. They will put some of you to death. And yet by your endurance you shall win your souls. He that holds out to the end shall be saved. I won't read all of these prophecies. They're tremendous. You can read them in Matthew yourselves. Now follows one of the clearest, most terrible, and yet most ignored parables in all the Gospels. One that we like to dodge. The Last Judgment. I seldom hear the preachers read it or preach about it. Why do we bypass this and seek some other way to get to heaven? Because we know that most, if not all of us, fail at this test. Simple, profound, majestic, terrifying, and yet so beautiful and so easy if we really love our neighbor as ourselves. It is the test of whether our discipleship is real. It agrees perfectly with everything Jesus said, everything. And when one ponders deeply upon it, we can see that it's the perfect way to sift out those who would be a liability, would ruin heaven, and those who would be an asset to the kingdom of love.
if only love can inherit the kingdom of heaven, then love must be our final examination. Love is the doorway to heaven, for heaven is love, and only love can enter it. So you remember all this story when the Son of Man comes in glory, he divides the nations, and to those on his right hand will say, Come, blessed of my Father, for when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was sick, you came to me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came. When I was a stranger, you came to me. And they'll say, when did we ever see you like that? And you will say, I tell you, whenever you helped anybody in need, you helped me. But to the others, he will say, depart from me. For when I was hungry and thirsty and naked and sick and in prison and a stranger, you did not help me. And they will go away, it says, to everlasting punishment and the upright to everlasting life. Here Jesus, the Son of Man, identifies himself with every needy human being in the world. <sighs> Jesus kept insisting that nobody knows the day nor the hour when these things will happen. So his followers must always watch and pray for fear they will be caught unprepared. Some of you have been asking if he's coming again. I suppose so. I don't know. I don't know what it'll be like, only what he's told. Always be vigilant and pray. In fact, he does come again at the hour of death to every one of us. But there's more than I understand about that. He said to those on the Mount of Olives on that Wednesday where he was with his disciples, you know that in two days the Passover festival is coming, then the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Judas, the money greeter thief, was so disgusted with Jesus that he went to the high priest and offered uh, betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. The high priests had planned to wait till that festival was over. They didn't want a riot. But Judas produced Jesus a prisoner at the worst time possible for his enemies. Two million visitors in Jerusalem would see Jesus hanging on the cross and they would tell all over the world all over the world, and that's exactly what Jesus had planned. I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men to me. And so Judas, never intending it, served Jesus' purpose. He compelled the Jewish leaders to kill Jesus just when Jesus chose, but when they didn't wish to do it. No man, said Jesus, takes my life, I give it. This is what I have heard from my Father just like an iceberg is nine-tenths submerged under the water. So the words and deeds and purposes of Jesus are nine-tenths hidden, and these orders Jesus constantly received from his Father. Only occasionally do we see these deep purpose. The, uh, I will not have time tonight to read, but in fact the time is up about that glorious, marvelous time in the upper room. There are five chapters in the Gospel of John that tell those lovely things he said. I can't go to that tonight. I don't know how much of this book is going to be time to finish. I hope that by this time we see that we're looking into the very heart of love itself, of the most wonderful person that has ever come into the world.